Welcome back to our summit. I'm Beth Genley, your host, and today I have the pleasure of introducing to you Dr. Randy Kamen, who is a psychologist and educator who pioneered new territory in mind-body medicine and positive psychology at Boston University Harvard Medical School. She is the author of the bestseller, Behind the Therapy Door, Simple Strategies to Transform Your Life. She helps women develop their inner strength and wisdom, self-compassion, successful relationships, and their ability to lead in all aspects of life. Dr. Karen presents at universities, women's conferences, corporations, and health retreats. She has a global reach in the media and in her online programs. She contributes to the Huffington Post and other major print and online publications. Dr. Kamen, welcome to the Get Your Life Back Summit. Thanks, Beth. Thanks for having me and for doing this beautiful work that's so needed. So thank you, and thank you for being here. Yes. <laughs> thank you. So I understand that you work with physicians at Harvard that are struggling with burnout. What do you find is most helpful for them? Well, I would say that it's an ongoing um, need or it's an ongoing um, willingness to develop friendships and have the support of other women, ideally. These women often feel like they're leaders and they isolate and they think they're lone wolves and when they connect with other women in the same position they miraculously find that they're in great company and they have so much to share and they're also continuously overloaded and juggling a multitude of demands so if they could learn to internalize and integrate some strategies that don't take a lot of time that they can use during the course of their busy lives that also helps i so much want to unpack that i those are wonderful comments the first one i want to go into is is the making connections because as you know i have a healthcare background and that was my experience as well that there's a very um everyone is an island kind of attitude throughout yeah traditional health care that encourages us to bottle everything up. We're not supposed to talk about our errors or our failures. And it can feel like everyone is doing okay except yourself. So I'd love for you to talk about that a little bit more. Well, and that's one of the best kept secrets is that people keep these secrets to themselves and they feel less than, especially because they're type A and they have very high standards for themselves. And then when they find that, yes, they're less than perfect, they feel terrible about themselves and feel like they need to keep this a secret and need to keep this under wraps. And the truth is that keeps them in a really one down position. It really keeps them feeling worse and, and more burnt out, you know, or it leads to burnout if they're not already there. And the idea of sharing it with somebody who gets it and cares about that other person only shows that, wow, we all have this thing in common because none of us are mistake free. None of us have, you know, somehow gotten by without growing up from time to time. And when we know that, that we're normal, that we're, you know, just doing the best that we can, we're striving for excellence rather than perfection, then we're all in it together. So let's say, let's imagine for a minute that I am one of these stressed out healthcare people. I won't pretend to be a doctor, but I am a nurse and I'm bursting with this feeling of I'm not perfect it hurts. I really want to and feel like I'm required to be perfect. That is, a, that is definitely a one down position to reach out to other people from. So what would you suggest to a person to kind of calm that a bit so that they're able to reach out? Well, the, the very first place that I start is um, when I work with people is that inner mastery, that sense of I can control my own physiology, I can control my own um, 
emotional chatter, especially the kind that speaks to I'm not worthy, I'm not good enough, and instead start having a little bit more self-compassion and self-love. And that's a learning curve. That's a big learning process. And it starts with just being able to ground oneself, being able to be in one's body without, you know, feeling like, you need to take flight or su suppress all the feelings that you're having, but just be with feeling state. Mm -hmm. And I usually start out with something as simple as teaching people a variety of uh, breathing strategies that they could use when they're stressed, when they're having difficulty sleeping, when they feel under motivated, when they're feeling disconnected. There are ways that you could breathe that kind of heighten your capacities to do all of these things. And then from there, I'll build it to, um, okay, how, do you, how could you picture yourself if you were to have the wherewithal to connect with somebody? What would it look like for you, Beth? You know, if I were speaking to you, if you were to take the initiative to reach out to somebody, how would that feel? What would that look, look like? And it's a real leadership move because I'm big into personal leadership. For example, nobody is the leader of Beth except Beth. <laughs> Nobody's the leader of Randy except Randy, no matter what, whether you've got a boss, whether you have responsibilities within your family you're your own leader and taking these leadership moves is such a boost in self-esteem like if you were to just pick up the phone and call somebody you weren't sure if maybe she'd like you or not or she'd really care but you did that no matter what the outcome it's a leadership move and it would increase your sense of well-being beautiful so you outlined several ways to be go from under resourced to more resourced if i can just briefly recap just breathing taking deep breaths and i'd love to hear about one of those strategies we have some yoga people who are going to be talking in more detail about right. breathing strategies yeah. but i'd love i'd love for you to be specific but getting centered in the body getting grounded having some self compassion and thinking of reaching out as a leadership move so that we're able to reframe it into a more uh, um, self-loving self-loving wonderful thank you a more self-loving frame so that we're able to do it from a place of resource so is that a fair summary i would say that's lovely absolutely you captured it and sounds sometimes easier than it is thank you because being dedicated to the breathing, for example, you know, it sounds like, oh, well, you know, I breathe all day long, I'm good enough at it. But the truth is, what we need to do for starters is to make conscious an unconscious act that we take for granted and really work on improving it so that if you're sitting at a meeting or if somebody's infuriating you um, or if you have a difficult patient, or if your mother calls you and you're like ready to blow your top, that you could self-regulate, that you could be in your body and actually open your heart up to be more compassionate to people that may be really aggravating you. And to know that we're all doing the best we can. Nobody is trying to act, you know, he or she is doing what they can do and you're doing what you could do. And I, you know, we all are. So I think we have to open our compassionate selves up, which is a learning process to each other and to ourselves so that we can be in relationship as we move throughout our days. You know, I, one thing I think is really important is no matter who you're dealing with as you move through the day, look into their eyes when you speak. Connect. Mm -hmm. This is our life right now. It's not tomorrow. It's not tonight. It's, it's right now. Here we are, you and me. So let's make it count. Let's connect. Mm -hmm. And if you could do that and train yourself to do that as you move through the day, 
your life is going to be so much better than what you ever may have imagined possible. Wonderful. So you have described, you've said that you have some very specific strategies that you give people to help them recenter and ground. And I would love to hear some of those. And then I have a little bit of a caveat I'd like to come back to, but I'd like to continue on this role for a minute. Okay. So um, it's in my book, but it's also, I, I teach this in my programs. Obviously, I can't go into it in the depth that I would like to. Um, we have a half hour, so we'll yeah, do what we can. Yeah. I mean, I do five-day workshops. Typically, I do year-long programs. So, And it's really based on this material because you, even if you learn it right away, it takes a long time to really internalize it and have it really in your brain so that your brain is wired differently and that it's wired so that it is working for you rather than against you. And most of us tell ourselves stuff all day long that's harmful, that's injurious to our well-being. And we could actually actually learn to retrain our brains so that it's more on our own team rather than fighting against us. So um, when you're relaxed, so after you do breathing, what one of the things I teach, so I, I'm not going to go into this, but one of the things I teach are, uh, or the series that I teach is about morning rituals that take under five minutes, afternoon, evening, and nighttime. Mm -hmm. And if you spend under five minutes in each one of those segments, you start to really internalize self-regulation. But one of the things I love to teach is um, calming your body down, calming your mind down anytime during the day. This can only take a few seconds. And internalizing something positive, just thinking about something positive that happened this day. Something that you could think of. Was it a good cup of coffee? Was it a nice conversation? Did you have a, a lovely interview with somebody? Did you have a good conversation? I, I find that it's often about nature or relationship. Mm -hmm. And just to take one little piece of that and let it really soak into your being. Rick Hansen, Dr. Rick Hansen talks a lot about this. What he calls it is taking in the good, in which you think about some positive trait about yourself or um, about something in relationship and you let it sink into the fiber of your being, to your heart, to your mind, to your core, to your spirit. You're just saying, okay, that was a sweet, sweet moment. And you're really allowing it to soak in just for 10, 20 seconds a day. And what, that hap what happens then is you consolidate these experiences that are short-term memory into the recesses of your mind and body and into long-term memory. Oh, so nice. you're not drawing from the negative, you're drawing more from the positive. Beautiful. Okay, so I want to go back to my caveat, which is that part of the issue for many people in caring professions is what they call compassion fatigue. You were talking about self-compassion, which I agree is absolutely central to, to being able even to take in the good, to being able to not argue with yourself about, well, it wasn't great. <laughs> but just to say that was a good moment and I enjoyed it and I am going to soak that up. When you get to the point where you're questioning your ability to care at all, what would be your first suggestion for a way to kind of retrieve yourself from that edge? Have some fun. Ah. Have some fun and take care of yourself. When you start, I mean, first of all, when you're, if you're burnt out, it's already a little late, but having fun along the way is, it should be part of one's daily routine. If, if you're not taking an hour a day or even half an hour a day, some part of the day to 
blast the stereo and dance around the living room or um, take a yoga class or meet up with a friend and just laugh your heads off or do something. Take a, a hike in the, in the if, if you live in the Northeast, in the snow with a pair of snowshoes. Just something that lights you up. You know, baking, you know, something that just gets your senses going. Take a salsa class. Make the time because if you have even one of those things going on on a regular basis, I sometimes sit at the piano. I will sit at the piano for 10 consecutive minutes. And I, I never did, I never me measured my heart rate pre and post. But I'm, I know I lower my heart rate. I know I feel I'm coming from a different place. It's like I went from one kind of brain activity right into another and get into some flow activity that has nothing to do with the stuff that is wearing you out. Because when you are full, when you feel like I'm getting what I need, you have a much better capacity to give to other people really in a wholehearted way. When, you're, when you don't have enough, it, it, it's very hard to properly give to other people. So it's not a, a, a matter of, I should really do this. It's that you, if you don't do it, you're ripping not only yourself off, but you're ripping off everybody in your life your kids, your partner, your, your work, because you're running on empty. That is absolutely key. I was remembering back to when I was really suffering burnout when my argument to you might have been, but my patients need me, but I have to give them everything I have. I have to put them first, always, because it wouldn't be unethical to do anything else. And I'd love your response to that. I totally disagree. <laughs> <laughs> I just think if you put them before you, uh, I mean, obviously, if it's a life or death situation, then of course. But if you put your patients, look, I've been in the field of healthcare for over 35 years with suicidal patients, with all kinds, you know, I've seen everything. If I always put them first. Um, I would have nothing to give. I would have nothing to give because if I'm running on empty and all I'm doing is giving and giving and giving, there's no end to how much I could give, right? But the truth is, if I'm not happy and if I'm not feeling good in my own skin, which for a period of my, I remember way back when, when I, I was a professor at BU Medical School, I had a private practice that was extremely full and two babies at home and I just felt like something's got to give something's got to give but it, it all mattered so much to me and eventually I gave up my professorship which broke my heart I'm now back uh, at actually I'm at Harvard Medical School now as a visiting professor but as a visiting teacher but Giving up that professorship was one of the hardest things I ever did because I loved that role. But I couldn't do it all. And we have to make choices. So, but the choice has to be you first. If the choice is not you first, everybody suffers. Your patients are not getting the best of you if you're in pain or suffering. That was certainly my experience. It took me a long time to learn that lesson, uh, but it's one that I speak about a great deal myself now, that, that recentering our own self-care and our own needs for goofiness and music and, and something other than seriously making a difference allows us to make that difference. Right. I, I mean, who would you rather see walk into your room when you're sick? Somebody who is just got a puss on their face because they've been working a 12 hour shift or somebody who's dancing in and saying, you look great. I, it's great to, you know, and I mean, I, I've had the, uh, I'm, you know, I, I've, I've 
spent a little time in the hospital over, I had a surgery and um, I remember there were some nurses that came in and I was like, to myself, get out of here. You are, you are the antithesis of what I need to heal. Mm-hmm. You know, I was just there for a few days. And then there would be other people that walked in and they, you know, they brought the sunshine with them. Who wants to spend time with somebody like that? And so many, so I used to work with nurses and burnout for years, actually uh, on the Northeast and not just at BU Medical, but at other places. And you know, nurses are not taught either how to do self-care. They're some of the, they're, they're as bad as doctors in terms of self-care. Yeah. Absolutely. They smoke, they overdrink, they, they don't take care of their relationship. You know, they, they do a lot of things that are self-destructive because they're not getting enough. When they're getting enough, they don't need to do so many of those self-destructive behaviors. Okay, so let's, let's kind of wrap this up with a bow, if we can. I'm hearing, so, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm hearing that we need to center ourselves physically and, and get grounded, but we also need to center our own experience in our priorities so that we are able to accomplish what we need to accomplish and that it doesn't come instantly, that we have, I loved your word, your, your, the chatter, the mind chatter. It takes a while to uh, quiet or to change it, it, at the very least to change what it's saying and, and make yes. it more positive. Yes. That reframing is very, very important. I'd just like to, to say a word about that. Yes. About how you reframe. So people have a... So the best way to reframe something is the minute you hear, it, it's, it's a, in a few steps. The minute you hear something negative towards yourself coming from your own head, pay attention to what you're saying. That's the first thing. Don't do anything about it. Just pay attention. After you've gotten familiar with the voice and what it's saying, and what I would recommend is that you very, take a few breaths and very kindly say it in a way like you would talk to a little girl, the little girl within you. And reframe that as if the best mommy in the whole world were saying it just the way you needed it. If you're saying, that was such a screw up. You're such an idiot, blah, blah, blah. You know, whatever stuff we say to ourselves. And we all do it in some form, but some of us better, you know, than, you know, are better at being kind than others. So you take that voice and you just say, okay, what would I say if it were the little Randy within or if it was the little Beth within? And how would I take care? Or what would I say to my best friend that was hurting? And then you say that to yourself and you keep repeating that and repeat that until that voice becomes more internalized. It takes practice though. Practice makes better. Practice makes. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. I I really like to avoid practice makes perfect because. (laughs) Yeah. Nothing makes perfect. Practice makes better. uh, Yes. I'm going to use that. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. All right. Any last words that you'd like to offer besides reframing that you feel would be, would kind of wrap this up? Well, um, I have a a chapter from my book that I really like to offer people because I think it's, it's just, uh, it's a really good one that gets at how to self-regulate. Okay. And, yeah, so it's in my book. I, whether you've read it or not, it's good to reread this particular chapter because it really gets at the heart of self regulation and what you need to do in extreme cases and in really moderate cases. So I, I'd love to offer that to your viewers. And um, I think that's about it. I. You know, just thank you for inviting me and for doing this this beautiful series. 
Thank you very much. I really appreciate your being here. And for people who would like to read that chapter, which sounds completely awesome, we will be sending the link to it with the information about this uh, talk and also uh, on the full, the full speaker summary page. It will be there as well. Thanks. So people can find the link in several places. Wonderful. That's a great offer. Thank you so much. And My thank pleasure. And thank you for all your wisdom today. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Beth.